your soils. Your future. And the future of all those relying on you. Managing and improving soil health has always been important, but is now considered to be a priority, both within the industry and at policy level. The, the House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee recently uh, published information uh, documenting that on average there's 2.2 million tonnes of soil erosion from the UK on an annual basis, uh, with a cost, estimated cost of £45 million per year in terms of lost productive potential. Uh, and I think as we go forward in a, in a post-Brexit world uh, with a new domestic agricultural policy, uh, soil health and soil quality and productivity and looking after our soils is going to be square and centre in terms of uh, agricultural policy. So as farmers it's really important that uh, uh, there's a better understanding of uh, soil management and uh, uh, farmers are better able to step up to the challenge of, uh, of managing their soils. The House of Commons Environmental Audit Committee is advocating proactive incentives for landowners to restore and improve soil quality in order to ensure continued and long-term productive capacity and resilience. However, there still remains widespread uncertainty as to the most appropriate management practices to improve soil health and the best way to measure and monitor soil quality. Historically, you know, the three pillars of sort of soil health are soil biology, soil physics and soil chemistry. And the focus has very much been on uh, understanding soil physics and, and cultivations and very much about feeding uh, plants and soil chemistry. And soil biology has been really the very the, the poor cousin uh, in, 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 of the, the sort of three legged stool. And uh, um, partly because actually biology is really difficult to, to understand and really difficult to measure. Uh, but uh, well, actually it's a fundamental part of, uh, uh, of good soil management and uh, now there is, you know, with, with advances in science there's, there's easier ways to understand some of those complexities and interactions between chemistry, biology and physics. Post-war farming practices have relied on artificial fertiliser and a movement away from traditional rotations and this in turn has led to a reduction in the amount of organic matter and carbon in the soil. The reduction in organic matter has led to a breakdown in soil structure and we see increasing levels of erosion and compaction in our soils. The loss of fertile arable soil is estimated at 2.2 million tonnes per year. Compare this with a capacity to form soil at a rate of 1 megagrams per hectare per year. With this level of loss, concerns are growing over future food security, sustainable agricultural production and predicted climate change. Expansion in farm size and ever-increasing machinery weight, whilst achieving economies of scale, can result in soil degradation from over-cultivation, compaction and untimely operations. A good example being potatoes and other root vegetables, often grown on marginal quality soils where destoning and restructuring through bed forming is required to produce the appropriate soil environment. But the consequence of this could be long-term loss of soil health and productive capacity unless mitigation is put in place. The impact of fertilisers and chemicals applied for fertility and crop protection are well understood above ground, but we know less about the impacts below ground for long-term soil health. Often cultivations are used to rectify soil health and structural problems, but they can cause as many issues as they resolve. Research from Harper Adams University suggests that 85% of cultivation activity is associated with repairing damage from previous activity. As we strive to increase livestock production, overgrazing and poaching have also added to the degradation of our soil. So what can we do to ensure our soils remain healthy, with optimum structure and consistency, for meeting our demands now and in the future? Stephen Briggs discusses suitable management practices to improve our soil health. If you were a farmer that had solar panels on the, on the farm, would you turn them off for July, August and September? Or would that be madness? Of course you wouldn't, but that's part of what we do 
in many arable cropping systems. We're not building, harvesting sunlight and building carbon through the middle part of the year when there's maximum solar radiation. So using cover crops to add diversity to the farm, put in different rooting structures, but importantly to harvest more sunlight, to build carbon, to energise our farming systems, has got to be a win-win for most farmers. For many farmers, uh, cover cropping, growing, a, a growing another non-harvestable crop between your two cash crops uh, can be a sensible option. To move it once uh, up, another, up another level, actually companion planting, uh, growing a companion with your cash crop to, to, to harvest more sunlight, build carbon uh, and, and actually in some instances take disease and pest pressure off the cash crop can be, can be a, uh, a way forward for some farmers. So there are, there are some farmers doing things like growing beans and cereals together in the same field. Uh, there, there are a few farmers in the UK now growing peola, which is all seed rape and peas, so it's a legume and a non-legume. Uh, and these all help in terms of diversity, different rooting structures. And importantly, if we're considering trying to improve soil health and mycorrhizal populations in the soil to harness the power of soil, beneficial soil fungi, recognising that some of the brassicas we grow, like all seed rape, are non-mycorrhizal hosts, having a companion plant growing at the same time, such as peas or vetches or, or phacelia, actually that bridges the gap in terms of uh, mycorrhizal, uh, mycorrhizal host gaps and keeps that mycorrhizae alive. Trying to include legumes as part of your, uh, your farming system uh, can bring real benefits in terms of soil ecology. If you want the, ri uh, the um, rhizo fixing bacteria to actually fix nitrogen, actually you need legumes as part of the system. So what you can see from here is the, uh, the nodules, big fat nodules on the plant itself, which are uh, making a, a bacterial relationship with rhizofixing bacteria to actually create uh, nitrogen from, from the atmosphere. What we're trying to achieve with good soil health is a good balance of air and water and structure. And organic matter has a key component in that, or a key function. So the organic matter then starts building up fungal relationships and bacterial relationships as that feeds on the organic carbon, uh, breaking that down and releasing plant foods. In return, then the earthworms uh, then eat some of that, that uh, carbon uh, as a source of protein uh, and carbohydrate, the carbohydrate being the actual organic material itself and the protein coming from the, the bacteria and the fungi which they're consuming as well. In return they leave structures as you can see here as an earthworm burrow and actually helps restructure our soils. Uh, earthworms themselves are nutrient multipliers and what goes in the front end of an earthworm and comes out the back as a worm cast is greatly enhanced in terms of nitrogen, phosphate, potash, magnesium etc. So what we're after is a nice crumb structure, soils that, uh, that fall apart easily, that have nice porous holes to allow water and air to interface uh, with, and allow our roots to explore through the soil profile to access those nutrients and water. So you can see where the earthworm has gone through the soil here and created a nice burrow uh, where they've been, been moving up and down through the soil. In return, the biology will then feed around that and that will leave nice channels for new roots um, uh, to, to explore the soil, for water to infiltrate, for air, air and water to exchange in the soil. Many farms have changed their rotations over the last 30 or 40 years in the drive for efficiency and simplicity, perhaps uh, historically having had uh, three, four or five or more crops, the Norfolk four course rotation is an example, perhaps getting rid of livestock, beef and sheep from the farm, simplifying it to an all arable system, perhaps contract farming it. Um, whilst that's brought productive benefits and, and cash benefits to the business, long term it has an impact on, on, on soil health. So finding ways to add in more diversity back into your farming system uh, by uh, having a, a wider range of crops, by uh, embedding uh, cover crops or companion planting with your, in, in your rotation, or perhaps even reintroducing livestock 
uh, as a first step to graze those cover crops or, or, or introduce grass, uh, grass clover, grass lay breaks to help combat things like black grass actually are going to be the, the, uh, the, the way, long term way forward and solutions for, for some farms. For many arable farms uh, who don't necessarily have the skills or infrastructure for livestock any longer, uh, the reintroduction of livestock is a big hurdle uh, and a big challenge. Uh, a, a small or sensible first step would be to perhaps bring somebody in to, to graze uh, cover crops, uh, then perhaps uh, building that capacity and skills with other neighbouring farmers or graziers to graze land in partnership with the arable business I think is, is a really sensible way forward. It isn't easy to put an economic uh, uh, figure on perhaps bringing livestock into the farm uh, on, on, a, on a sort of grazing basis. But if you consider that uh, if, if you're not having to terminate your cover crops uh, with um, either herbicides or cultivations, that you can allow the livestock to do that, there's a cost saving. Uh, and equally, some of the urinating and dunging from that livestock is bringing fertility back into, back into the farm. Uh, and there's been quite a bit of research to show that the, you know, the golden hoof does bring some benefits in terms of uh, uh, imparting fertility back to the farm. For many farmers, uh, cover cropping, growing, a, a growing another non-harvestable crop between your two cash crops uh, can be a sensible option. To move it once uh, up, another, up another level, actually companion planting, uh, growing a companion with your cash crop to, to, to harvest more sunlight, build carbon uh, and, and actually in some instances take disease and pest pressure off the cash crop can be, can be a, a way forward for some farmers. For grassland farmers, uh, uh, either in permanent pasture or, or grass lays, actually increasing diversity can be just as important. Uh, moving away from um, uh, a few species of shallow rooting perennial ryegrass to, have, to perhaps including herbs and legumes to create herbal rich lays which then build soil in a vertical direction by putting greater root down through the soil uh, which in turn improves its drought resistance, improves soil structure at death and its ability to hold livestock numbers above ground uh, has, has proven to be quite, quite a successful uh, uh, way of farming for quite a number of farmers. Uh, whilst there's a necessity for some uh, farmers to till intensively, especially for things like root crops, uh, there, there should be a desire for many farmers to actually only do the tillage that you need to do and, and not, not do more than you need to do. Uh, there, there are some farmers now uh, developing or with, with long-term experience of, of no-till systems, uh, integrating those with cover crops and we're seeing some really good uh, improvements in soil health as a result of having ground covered all the time uh, uh, with, a, with a green growing plant, whether that be cash crop or cover crop. Uh, what that means for many farmers is they've got to spend time uh, learning new skills and, and getting to grips with new equipment in terms of direct sowing and perhaps changing their management and their agronomy uh, to match with those sort of no-deal situations. But there are farms in, in the north and the south and the east and the west of the country that have been doing it now for five to ten years with, not without its challenges, but with, with enough success to say that actually it, it can work really well here in England. I, I guess one of the biggest challenges in, in agriculture is is the saying that we've always done it this way. Um, and the biggest challenge is, is to open your mind to perhaps new ideas of trying things differently. And, and, and all farming businesses clearly don't want to take risks. So with any of these new practices, I would never recommend that anyone does half the farm in one go. What you want to do is try a practice on perhaps just a few acres and build up your experience and your confidence. And secondly, go and surround yourself with other farmers that are that are also been trying practices and learn from what they're doing and part of what we're trying to do in, in innovation for agriculture is to link up those farmers together so they can share their experiences and their challenges in terms of uh, developing these new new ways of farming so what do we say about soil i mean it is the most fundamental uh, resource that we have on the farm if we don't have soil available what can we grow it's our most precious resource 
and it's our, our most valuable resource. So caring for it for the long-term productive capacity of the farm is, is, has got to, be a, got to be a high priority. So as you can see, there's lots to be learned from farmer experiences, from those doing conservation agriculture, organic and innovative practices. Your soils, your future. Innovation for Agriculture is a consortium of English agricultural societies. We help farmers make the best use of existing and emerging science to better enable them to meet the challenge of feeding the growing population whilst optimising productivity and improving 